good evening everyone uh, it's an honor for me to present here today my sincere thanks to dr sakuja for this opportunity now the topic for my presentation today is going to be de novo donor specific antibodies after kidney transplantation so there are two terms here one is de novo the other is donor specific antibodies now let's dissect them a little what is a dsa now it's simple dsa stands for donor specific antibodies donor is a simple term specific is directed against the donor but when we say donor specific antibodies what antibodies we are referring to now the current technology which is the commonly used luminex platform didx only igg antibodies directed against donor hla so in a way though we call it donor specific antibodies we are actually looking only at the igg antibodies directed against donor hla or an igg anti hla antibodies obviously there are other antibodies that can also be detrimental to the graft so what about igm anti hla antibodies and what about non hla antibodies so these are also important and we'll go over them a little later after we finish the donor specific antibodies that are basically igg directed against hla now what is this luminex platform now when we say luminex it's a company's name luminex corporation and they have come up with a similar what is similar to a flow cytometer so it's actually a dual laser cytometer there are two lasers that sort of interrogate the individual beads in the platform so what are these beads there are about 100 beads available for a given reaction this is basically a multiplex test the advantage is that in a simple single reaction you are able to identify more than one or any number of antibodies that are in the serum so there are two types of two companies that produce these assays one is lab screen which is the com the company is known as one lambda this was the one company that was originally started by dr paul terasaki and the other one is life core now what these two companies do is to create a contingent of beads plastic beads now each bead has two different colors at different concentrations and when you shine a laser depending on the intensity of two different colors you are able to identify the bead as say one bead is b21 another bead is b26 something like that now when we say a single antigen bead each bead is coated with one hla antigen so the advantage is if this entire 100 beads is incubated with serum and the appropriate anti human antibodies are added to pick up this binding of hla antibodies in the serum to these beads then you can use these lasers to identify which bead we are talking about and based on that you are able to say in one reaction there is this antibody at this much strength and another antibody at a different strength so the multiplexing of the antibodies has revolutionized the way single anti i mean the way anti hla antibodies are tested because you do not need lot of serum just in a small amount of serum every antibody that's present in the circulation can be identified now when we say antibody it's a little tricky now this image here shows the presentation of a hla class 1 or hla class 2 on the cells so you have say this is a hla class 1 there are three things here one is the class 1 heavy chain which has three domains alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 the other one is the beta 2 microglobulin chain and the third one is the peptide so in a given cell when an antigen is presented you have all these three together that is being presented to the lymphocyte now when this the same situation these three three things the heavy chain the beta 2 microglobulin and the peptide when they are coated on the beads because these are all synthetically derived 
you cannot replicate this exact configuration on the beads. So that's why these beads are known as denatured in a way that what they are identifying is sort of a synthetic HLA that is coated on these beads. So it can be denatured in the sense that all three can be there in a different configuration. Only the peptide and the heavy chain may be there. The heavy chain alone can be there or the heavy chain and the light chain I mean, and the beta to microglobulin without the peptide can be there. So it's important to understand that when we talk about antibody deduction, it is not replicating the exact antigen that's present in the class 1 HLA that's present in all nucleated cells and class 2 that is present in antigen presenting cells. Now again, the company has come up with three different types of beads. Now in US and mostly in our lab, what we use this is a single antigen bead. So my rest of the talk will be focused on the single antigen bead. So what is single antigen bead? Now I said 100 beads here. Each bead is coated with one antigen. So for example, bead number one is coated with A1, for example. Bead number two can be A2 antigen, so on and so forth. So the advantage of this is that the relative antigen density is high and the resolution is high, meaning that at this time, based on the currently available techniques, the single antigen bead assay or the SAB is the most accurate way of determining the presence of anti-HLA antibodies. So this is a cartoon of single antigen bead, you, single antigen bead assay, the green, this is the beads and this is the antigen coated there. When serum is incubated, if you have the corresponding antibodies, these antibodies binds to this antigen present on the bead and then you add a phycoerythrin conjugated goat IgG that goes and binds to the FC portion of this human H antibodies and this is washed and red. So this is the simplest way in which a single antigen bead assay can be performed. Now let's go back a little. In what happens when an antigen and antibody binding happens? So this is the classical component complement pathway. You have, let's say these are the endothelial cells. You have HLA antigens. The antibody binds. So once the antibody binds, you have the first initial protein component of the complement, which is the C1 complex or C1Q binding to this. And then the complement cascade is established, which results in the terminal membrane attack complex, which punctures hole in the cell membrane and kills the cell. So the current assay of single antigen beads can be modified. How do you modify? Now, all we are showing here is that there is an antigen coated on a plastic bead. There is an antibody and both of them are binding. So does this automatically mean that complement will be fixed and eventually this will result in cell death? In other words, does every antibody that's present in the circulation is pathogenetic? We do not know that. So for that, there are refinements to the conventional single antigen bead assay. And one refinement is the presence of the identifying whether this particular anti, the HLA antibody that we are talking about, is it a complement fixing antibody or not? So how this is done? Again, this technique is the same, but the test can be modified so that the, the phycoerythrin anti-human antibodies can be used to identify whether CQ, C1Q has bound to the antigen antibody. So in other words, instead of simply saying that there is an antibody, you can go to the next level and say that this antibody is not just any other antibody. It's an antibody that can bind C1Q, which means that this antibody is there and it can potentially cause mischief by causing activating the classical component pathway and causing cell death. Now, again, in this testing process, there is something known as prozone effect, which is important to understand. Now, what is this prozone effect? Now, prozone effect results in a false negative test, meaning that the serum appears negative when it is tested undiluted. So you take a serum, send it to the laboratory, asking that, can you please check whether there is donor-specific antibodies? 
the lab does the test and reports that the non-specific antibody is negative. But in reality, it's a false negative test. Why is that? Because there are because of two reasons. One is that what is known as the prozone effect, though it's erroneously called prozone effect, this terminology has stuck. What it means is that when complement system is getting activated, the C1Q or the C3T can sort of bind to the antibodies with the result that the reporter antibody, the phycoerythrin conjugated goat anti-human antibody that's added to the system to find out whether an HLA antigen has been bound to an antibody is blocked. So when this blocking happens in an undiluted serum, typically in the laboratory, these are tested in undiluted or what is known as a neat serum, then this blockage results in a negative test. So there can be full of circulating antibodies in the system, but the report will be coming out as something that's negative. So for this, a couple of things can be done. One is to dilute the serum or treat it with EDTA, sort of which breaks down this and allows the T conjugated antibody to bind to the system. So most of the labs in US currently routinely treat the serum with EDTA. So when the report comes, they say the serum will, has been treated with EDTA to make sure that the prozone effect has been taken care of. So how is the output of these antibodies reported? You would have heard of the term median fluorescent intensity. Now, in general, as physicians, we are used to think of as when we say output and cut point, when we do a test, we expect a result. And that result is a quantitative term. Check for creatinine. Creatinine is one milligram per deciliter. That's a quantitative term. We have in our mind a linear scale in which we think, okay, this patient's creatinine is two milligrams, which has gone up from one milligram, or it, the creatinine has dropped to 0 0.5, 0 0.8. It has gone down from one to 0.8. So whether it's blood pressure or creatinine or glucose or white count or hemoglobin, for any quantitative measurement, we have a linear scale that we sort of think. But unfortunately, the median fluorescent intensity or the output of the DSA measurement is not on a linear scale. In fact, it is no scale at all. MFI is not a strength. MFI is not a concentration. It is, it's not a quantitative assessment and does not represent the concentration or the type of the antibody. It's simply a beats relative fluorescence without reference to a standard. So this makes it obvious that you, it is very difficult. It's not that it cannot be done, but it is very difficult to standardize the MFA values across different labs or even across different beats or across different samples. But despite that, when we read papers, we will say that, okay, the lab says it's more than 500 or more than 1000 MFI, more than 1000 MFI is associated with something. So we try to use this as a quantitative measurement but in reality, we need to understand that this is not a quantitative measurement. Again, the question that comes is, AKI, let's say acute kidney injury, we can come up with a creatinine definition. Okay, creatinine has doubled or come up with an absolute number. Creatinine more than 1.3 or 1.4 is called as acute kidney injury. Like that, our tendency is again to ask for a cut point and say that what is the MFI threshold above which it is positive? So this is in a way becomes a sort of a philosophical question. When we say threshold, threshold for what? What do we want to achieve here? So the original thresholds that came was mostly to find out at what point of DSA determination by Luminex, your flow or your CDC cross match becomes positive. So one can say that I also want a threshold for saying, does this patient is an increased risk of uh, a slow chronic antibody mediated injury or are we talking about acute hyperacute rejection so that there is something that's going to happen on the table the antibody titers are so high much above my threshold so that there is something that's going to that there will be an immediate hyperacute rejection so the question here is what is this MFI threshold for? So we need to be careful when interpreting a given lab's MFI threshold and ask the question, working closely with the lab, trying to find out what, what is meant by this threshold and based on what this threshold has been determined. Now, let's, let me 
spend a few minutes here. This is our uh, our uh, tissue typing laboratories DSA report. Now let's focus here. This is the this is the patient. This is the donor information, and this is how DSA is reported: the HLA for the patient, HLA for the donor, and the DSA is reported here. Now, where are these numbers coming? These numbers are coming from here, which is your single antigen beat assay. So as I told you, I'm focusing only on class two single antigen beat here. Say, so as I told you, there are 100 beats. Let's say first beat is DR1, second beat is DR1. Again, it's a DR1, but it's a different antibody specificity. So these are the 100 beats that are available in the system. And when a serum is added, the machine does not know whether we are dealing with DSA or non-DSA. It simply provides an output for each bead, and this is the output for each bead or the MFA value. So this means for this patient, this patient is sensitized in the sense that this patient has multiple antibodies against HLA. Remember that unlike blood group antibodies, you do not have natural antibodies against HLA. Even that concept is changing a little, but for all practical purposes, let's assume that there is no natural antibody. If I am HLA A2, if I'm blood group A, I have natural antibodies against blood group B. But if I'm HLA A2, I don't have natural antibodies against other HLAs unless I'm sensitized. So this patient is sensitized, meaning that there are plenty of antibodies as shown here. Our lab cut point is 2000. So you will see here that IgG DSA greater than or equal to 2000 MFI detected against donor HLA antigen. Now, how do we know this is donor? That's what this information is put here. So you look at the donor HLA and then the machine provides, okay, donor has HLA A1 and let's look at HLA. I'm not, I'm not showing the class one here, but let's look at the HLA A1 B and find out what the MFI is. The MFI is 448. So that number is given here. Now, why am I showing this information in this detail? It's because of this. You will see here that it's HLA DR52 is written as 10,000, but it's stuck and a number is written hand, by hand that it is 1186. Now, is it a mistake? No. What happens is, let's look here. This is DR52. If you look DR52 here, there are three beats in the reaction. So each bead is providing an MFA value. The machine, the computer algorithm simply picks up the highest MFA value, which is 10,390 and puts it here. So what it means that DR52, I did a Luminex single antigen bead. In that reaction, there are three DR52 beads. The highest bead is 10,390 and that's what is given here. Now, this patient, the donor is DR52, but DR52 has several subtypes. Now, it so happened that this donor had a high resolution typing done. And if you see here, this donor's high resolution typing is for DR52. It's DR52 of B3 chain. You will see that the high resolution typing is 01. We'll come back in a little moment. What is meant by this high resolution typing? So now, if you look at DRB3, so there are only, of the three beats for DR52, only one beat has this 01. So we are talking about this high resolution typing of 01 here, which is the next level after DR52. And of the three beats available here, you will find that only one beat is DR52 subtype 01. So in reality, Though the superficial level typing for this patient is DR52, this patient DR52 is further subdivided into DR52B311. So the antibody directed against that is simply 1186 and not 10,000 MFI. So that's why it's put here as 1186. So if you go by our threshold of 2000, this is not a positive antibody. I hope I have made this clear at this point. Now, again, when I say it is not a positive antibody, we are not 
talking something like a tuberculous antigen. It's present or absent, nothing like that. It is not positive in the sense that, again, I asked the question in the previous slide, threshold for what? So one can say that this is not a positive antibody in the sense that you are not talking about a hyperacute rejection or a positive cross match if this would have been happened in a pre-transplant scenario. But in a post-transplant, is this tighter or this MFI value significant enough to cause a problem in the long term? Yes. So this is the major histocompatibility complex. So it's a gene cluster that's present in all jawed vertebrates. A, B, and DR is the commonly reported where most polymorphisms are present and it has strong association with graft outcome. But remember that it is not simply A, B, and DR alone. DP, DQ, and C also plays a major role. So though our focus is only on A, B, and DR. Now, I told high resolution typing and I told subtypes. What is this HLA nomenclature? So the current HLA nomenclature is written like this. We call this fields and there are four fields here. Field one, field two, field three, and field four. Plus, after the end of field four, you have a suffix, which is a series of alphabets here. Now, the way serological typing is done, once upon a time, HLA was determined by serology. Just add like your blood group typing, just add serum and cells and then see whether there's agglutination. And then you know that you're, you're dealing with this particular antigen. So the serological typing is this field. The next level of typing goes to the, the second field, which is 101. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, when we say serological typing, currently in the United States, all HLA laboratories are supposed to do a DNA-based assays for HLA and not serology. So when you use a DNA typing for HLA, we call a low resolution typing, a high resolution typing, and an allelic resolution. So what's meant by that? Low resolution DNA typing corresponds to the serologically defined types, which is your field one resolution. Now, when you go back, this is the typical way HLA is reported, HLA-A1, HLA-A3, but this is not serology. This is serology equivalence, but this is all done by DNA typing. So in other words, every lab is supposed to do a low at the minimum to get license and to function. They need to do a low resolution DNA typing, which is equivalent to your serological typing. So this corresponds to serological typing. Now, field two is identification of an HLA allele that encodes the same protein sequence within the antigen binding site. So when you go to a high resolution typing, we define field two. Here, the example I have provided is 101, which means that HLA-A2, 101, and HLA-A2, 102 are different proteins, but does not react with each other in serological test. In other words, when you do a serology, you cannot, if I am A2-101 and you are A2-102, simply by doing serology, you cannot differentiate between you and I. But when we do a molecular typing at a high resolution level, you are able to say, I am 02-101 and you are 02-102. Why is it important? Do we need this? Now, imagine a scenario where there is unlimited supply of organs. We don't care about all this. Simply HLA-A2, is it fine? Yes, there is an organ available, go ahead. But the problem happens is when you do a serological or a low resolution typing and simply call it ALA, HLA02 and there is HLA antibody present, what are we going to do? We are going to say that this recipient and donor are not compatible. Because there is always a short supply of organs, you want to match for compatibility as much as possible. So we have gone to the next level and say that, okay, Two people are having HLA-A2, but if one is 101 and another is 102, then if I don't have an antibody against 102, then I'm able to get that organ. So in other words, this resolution is important to further subtype the HLA so that to identify whether the antibody present is really directed against one particular type or the other particular type of this field too. So we spoke about HLA 
which is probably very simple. Now, if this is so simple, what about the other non-HLA or other minor histocompatibility antigens? Now, minor histocompatibility antigens are highly glycosylated MHC encoded molecules. You know that MHC class 1 related genes A and B are mica A, mica and mic B are important. There was a New England Journal paper several years ago that associated MIC A and MIC B with long-term graft function. This MIC proteins acts as a ligand for natural killer cells and CD8 positive cells. These are basically short peptides derived from processed polymorphic proteins and are expressed on multiple cell types in our body. Now, what about non-histocompatibility antigens? Endothelium serves as the major source of cocktail of antigens. Angiotensin receptor type 1 is an important non-histocompatibility antigen. Endothelin, type, endothelin 1 type A receptor, vimentin, vascular base membrane component perlican are some of the non-histocompatibility endothelial antigens. Now, commercially available kits are, I mean, there are kits that are commercially available, but still there are only selective labs that does this non-histocompatibility antigens. Now, let's go a little deeper into this. When we say non-histocompatibility antigens, now I said HLA is more polymorphic. If you are donating kidney to me, your HLA and my HLA are different, so I can form antibody against you in the post-transplant situation, which is your post-transplant DSA. But your endothelial cell and my endothelial cell are more or less similar. So your angiotensin type 1 receptor and my angiotensin type 1 receptor are going to be the same. So when you say I am as a kidney recipient forming an antibody against vimentin or angiotensin type 1 receptor, are we saying I am developing an autoimmune disease because more or less your and mine angiotensin receptor is similar? Now that's as of now, we assume that this is all sort of a yeah, loss of tolerance, immunological tolerance and autoimmunity, meaning that I develop antibody against normal body components, which is angiotensin receptor type 1 or endothelin and so on and so forth. But is that real? Meaning that do we definitely know this is not alloimmunity? Because there is a lot of single nucleotide polymorphisms, is there a guarantee that my AT1 receptor and your AT1 receptor are not changing at an amino acid level? We do not know the details of that yet. A couple of years ago, we published a paper where we introduced a concept known as allogenomics. We did DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing looks at the entire DNA contingent, but instead of focusing on the entire DNA, we looked at what is known as exome sequencing or sequencing of the DNA that codes for protein. And then try to find out in that whole DNA sequencing information, what are the amino acid mismatches between recipient and donor? An example is provided here. Now lysine and lysine here is, let's say this is your uh, angiotensin receptor situated on the cell surface. Now lysine and lysine are same, but here there is a change in the amino acid. Now this change in the amino acid is obviously can create an antibody response because there is a mismatch here at that particular level. So based on this type of amino acid mismatches across the entire contingent of protein coding DNA, we came up with a mismatch score, meaning that higher the score, more the amino acid mismatches. And then based on three different transplant cohort, we were able to show an inverse association between EGFR and this allogenomic score over a long term, meaning that if you have a high score, meaning that if you have plenty of mismatches across the amino acids between the donor and the recipient, you have a inferior graft outcome over the long term. So this is something to keep in mind that non-histocompatibility antigens may not cause an acute problem, but over time, there is a problem. So we dissected the word donor-specific antibody or this antibody, but what is de novo? The, it's a Latin term from the beginning, meaning that it happens after the transplant from, from based on at least what we want to know in a transplant scenario. But is that real? So this is what this, let's go back to this again. Now, when I said 448 is the DSA here, or 2406 is the DSA here, 
Now, how are these studies done when somebody says de novo donor specific antibodies? You look at the report, pre transplant, what was the DSA? Positive, negative. Post transplant, what is the DSA? Positive, negative. So if you go like that, remember that I told our lab cutoff is 2000. So somebody with a DSA, somebody with an MFI of 1531 or 1999 will be labeled as negative pre-transplant. And tomorrow after transplant, if this becomes, this 1531 becomes 2005 or this 1999 becomes 2400, we are going to call it positive and we are going to call it de novo, meaning that this happened after the transplant. So in a way, this is semantics, meaning that to say that there was completely absent antibody response before transplant, and this all happened completely new after transplant is a little challenging. But studies continue to go with the idea that there are preformed antibodies. At some point, you decide to do desensitization, and for several patients, you do not say flow B positive. You simply go ahead, increase your steroid dose, increase your thymoglobulin, and then go ahead with the transplant. That is one group of individuals. And certain other group of individuals develop new antibodies post-transplant. This is the Alex Lupi's Paris uh, study from France in two, uh, New England Journal 2013 that looked at this uh, C1Q antibodies. In that, you will see that de novo antibodies, C1Q negative at the C1Q DSAs negative pre-transplant, but positive post-transplant has the worst outcome in terms of graft loss. This again has to be taken with a grain of salt. It's simply possible that somebody who has a pre-transplant antibodies, because you know that they have pre-transplant antibodies, you monitor them more carefully. And post-transplant, there may be a time delay. So because of that, this could have been simply a time effect rather than the property of the antibody that's causing this problem. So to summarize, so DSA is not, when a DSA is reported as absent, in a post-transplant situation, remember that MFI value, what is meant by absent? MFI is a continuous scale. There, it's not a linear scale. So if a lab uses a dichotomous cut point, 2000 is negative, 2000 more than 2000 is positive, we need to be aware of that. Absent at the time of biopsy, but what about earlier? You do a biopsy today at that, thinking that there is something wrong, and that time it is absent, but what about earlier? Again, most of the labs focus on HLA, A, B, D, R. What about others? As I said, DSA strength and rather than MFA value and complement mediated prozone effect and EDTA treatment, whether this has been done or not. I think I'm running out of time, but let me finish in a couple of minutes. Now, obviously, this all takes to the next level that you need some molecular monitoring tools. Simply following creatinine post-transplant is not enough. There are several tools that are available in the market. This true graph comes from whole blood mRNA. This is approved and it is commercially available. Plasma cell-free DNA, which is the commercial test. Now, there are three companies providing this. And this is developed in our lab, in Dr. Sudantran's lab, which is our urine cell-free, uh, I mean, urine uh, cell mRNA profile. And we are trying to use a home filter in which patient is able to get his own urine sample, isolate RNA and send it to us. And, I, and we do the uh, gene expression profile to see the gene expression is sort of uh, molecular quiescence or molecular activity going on. And in also in blood samples, you can look at CD4 positive T cell activity to see whether a CD4 cells are sort of a sleeping cells or an active cells. So there are several molecular monitoring tools that are in the market and further that are being developed. Now, finally, let there be de novo DSA. So what, why do we care? So the problem is this. Now, over time, you will have a chronic endothelial injury remodeling to the kidney with the result that you develop transplant glomerulopathy. As you see here, this is the arrow points to the double contouring on the silver stain. And this you will see the MPGN-like picture or the uh, sort of a proliferative GN-like picture. So what is this transplant glomerulopathy? As I said, you have an antibody that's binding to the antigen on the endothelial cell. It not only kills the cell, in, at one level, but simply the binding of HLA to HLA antibody to HLA antigen activates the endothelial cell, which results in a lot of cytokines being produced, 
bringing in lot of cellular infiltrates macrophages nk cells and causing problems or an inflammatory state at the local level which results in constant remodeling which results in double contouring of glomerular basement membrane change in architecture proteinuria fibrosis gradual progression to end stage kidney disease this is a paper that we published uh, in fact pallavi is uh, is currently in bangalore she was our former fellow here this was in kidney international uh, on 92 patients with transplant glomerulopathy what is important here is of these 92 patients only 25% had a documented acute rejection episode the remaining did not have a documented acute rejection episode what does it mean it's not that every antibody that's going to happen after transplant will result in acute rejection at least when you result in acute rejection you have an idea that okay i have identified a problem but instead if there is a slow chronic ongoing injury that happened in 75% of these patients it will end up in transplant glomerulopathy so it's important to keep in mind that there is the most common way in which donor de novo donor specific antibody manifests is a slow chronic ongoing injury which results in graft loss over a long term so this is my last slide so we discussed about donor specific antibodies we discussed about what are the consequences of donor specific antibodies i am not going into the treatment we can discuss that during the panel discussion a little more but after all this it's so depressing that you have a patient you have transplanted but these antibodies come you are not do, able to do a lot so where are we going in the future now again we are in an exciting time where there is lot of molecular monitoring and molecular tools that are available one such revolutionary technique is a single cell rna sequencing now sequencing is a technique to determine the order of nucleotides in a segment of dna and rna so by doing a transcriptome sequencing you can look at the entire mrna or a micro rna contingent of a given sample now single cell rna sequencing allows comparison of transcriptome of an individual cell now this is a recent review that we wrote in current opinion of organ transplantation published recently so what it does is you take a kidney biopsy sample dis dissociate into cell different cell a uh, single cell suspension add colored beads each bead will capture the mrnas that are present in each cell and then after sequencing you will do an analysis which basically separates out the cell so you have this colored here each color represents a cell so now you are able to talk or you are able to identify a single cell what is the transcriptome profile and you start separating out those cells as okay this is your endothelial cell this is your proximal tubule this is your nk cell this is your monocyte cell so what we can go to the next level to find out each cell what are they trying to do one example let me show here now this is a transplant patient who had a biopsy who had an acute antibody mediated rejection treated completely creatinine came back to normal no proteinuria 9 months later you do a surveillance biopsy and that surveillance biopsy shows some cells here and there but otherwise everything is fine no fibrosis but if you look at the endothelial cells these are all the four different types of endothelial cells you will see that one type of endothelial cells is producing some cytokines cxcl9 cxcl10 or cxcl11 these are all called interferon gamma inducible proteins these chemokines are attracted to t cells so in other words 9 months after successful treatment of an antibody mediated rejection successful by our conventional terminology somebody's endothelial cells in the kidney is still producing cytokines that are attracting the t cells so this provides a rationale of why these patients should be followed treated and provides a mechanistic basis of why an episode of antibody mediated rejection creates problem over the long term though we may think that creatinine is fine biopsy is fine so the patient is completely improved so these are certain techniques that are available currently lot of research is going on here and in future hopefully we will be able to better understand the mechanistic aspects of what this de novo donor specific antibodies are doing and how long term graft dysfunction can be prevented let me stop here